Mark P. Otten back with you. Okay, so this is your uh, introduction to correlation, um, which will be followed by your introduction to regression. Um, so uh, we're going to start with a, a new example here. This is a uh, relationship between mother's anxiety. As this is real data that I worked on uh, analyzing in the past. Mother's anxiety as experienced at various points in the pregnancy can be assessed either by physiological or self-report measures. Um, so we're going to suppose that a mother was asked about her anxiety level on a scale of 1 to 10, self-report style, um, at a certain point in the pregnancy, and then that was correlated with the baby's uh, health, which uh, a substitute for that sometimes in the literature uh, is the birth weight of the baby, implying that the heavier the baby, the healthier the baby, which is not always true, but in this case, uh, it's, it's a common measurement, sort of the initial measurement anyway of health of the baby. So the, th the hypothesis here would be something like the, as the mother's anxiety increases, baby's birth weight decreases and vice versa. And if we uh, do not imply any sort of cause there, um, we're just saying as one goes up, the other goes down, um, then uh, maybe we're uh, looking at a correlation hypothesis. Um, so uh, we're going to start by uh, making a scatter plot of these data. Uh, the scatter plot is a look at one variable on the x-axis and the other variable on the y-axis. So I'm going to go over here to SPSS and call the first variable mom's anxiety and the second variable birth weight. Now if you guys are um, pros at data entry, you guys should be able to do this now. Um, you go to variable view as I just did. Uh, name your variables, then you move back over to data view, and you enter in your scores here. So 1.9, 4, 6.1, and so on. This is the exciting part of the video. As you guys watch me do data entry, feel free to fast forward. Actually, it won't take very much more time. Okay, I'm done. All right. So there's your data, and we're going to go to... Um, there's a couple different places, actually, to get a scatter plot in SPSS, um, but we're going to go to... Uh, graphs, legacy dialogues, and scatter slash dot. Um, again, I don't know why these things are, there's a legacy dialogues menu where all these graphs are available. I don't know why it's called legacy dialogues, but anyway, this is where uh, the, I'm going to get the scatter plot. Uh, it's where I usually go. Uh, so if you click on that, you're going to go to simple scatter, which is the default. Click define, uh, and as it says in the notes there, putting anxiety on the on the x-axis and birth weight on the y-axis. That's arbitrary. We could have switched that actually if we wanted. Um, it'll The graph will look a little bit different, but the uh, interpretation will be the same if you flip those, uh, as long as you just have two variables to work with. So uh, I'm going to just click through. And SPSS thinks about it. And there you go. So there's your mom's anxiety on the x-axis going up to a maximum of 8. Uh, birth weight going up to a maximum of 8.5. The minimum on the y-axis is 6, it looks like, and not 0. So that kind of distorts it a little bit. It's as if we zoomed in on the graph. SPSS will make those decisions for you, um, whether you like it or not. Uh, but what does this mean? Well, let's get back to the notes to check that out. Okay, so what does the scatter plot tell us? It tells us uh, absolutely nothing. No, it, it tells us... Uh, a couple of things. Uh, it tells us how our x and y variables are related, uh, and it gives us the first estimate of what their correlation would be, a correlation being the estimate of the relationship between the two variables. So um, we can draw a regression line through. Uh, we're going to come back to that. That's in video number two of this particular uh, lesson, I guess, this week. Um, is to talk about how the regression line is drawn. It minimizes the collective distances from all points to the line. So basically what you're doing when you draw a regression line is you're drawing a line through the middle of the points. Um, that's the less fancy way to say that. Um, but we'll come back to that in a minute um, in terms of how it, exactly it's drawn. Um, if the slope of this line, so imagine you're drawing a, a line through the points, and if the slope goes from lower left to upper right, then the variables have a positive correlation, and if the slope is the other way, upper left to lower right, then the variables have a negative correlation. So if you draw this line, you don't have a number necessarily, but you know whether the correlation is positive or negative, and then we follow up to get that number 
typically uh, to define it better. So positive correlation in the end uh, is going to be as one variable goes up, the other tends to go up too, and the negative correlation is that as one goes up, the other goes down. So for our example, you see our correlation there. We haven't drawn the regression line yet, but uh, if you were to imagine it, you've got that one uh, uh, dot there on the scatter plot uh, as a uh, in the upper left, and that's going to probably pull the line up toward that dot. So if you're drawing a line through those points, it's probably going to be upper left to lower right. Um, and that will allow you to have, let's say, a couple of dots above the line and a couple of dots below the line. And so uh, you might predict, based on this initial information, that our, our correlation is going to be negative, right? Upper left to lower right. And so then, as one variable goes up, the other tends to go down. And you can kind of see that, right, with the, with the graph as well, just in terms of the two variables. So as mother's anxiety goes up, that is, you're going further and further to the right on the x-axis, it looks like your likelihood of getting a dot that's lower, right, on birth weight is, is increasing, right, because that one dot on the left side, again, is so high. So again, this is not very scientific so far, but it's an initial... Um, interpretation from the scatter plot that we then follow up on with more official information to come. So suppose we say that a, a mom's anxiety increases, baby's birth weight uh, decreases. We cannot, however, say that mom's anxiety causes her, like more anxiety from the mom causes the baby to be unhealthy. We, we could, but that would be, that would be uh, not well received by the scientific community because we're only uh, concluding based on correlation here. And the golden rule here, I put it in red print so you guys can, um, can uh, remember this forever. Correlation does not imply causation. So you may have heard this slogan before. Basically what we're trying to uh, impress upon you with this is just that as you determine the relationship between the two variables, you're not determining cause at the same time. So there's uh, examples here, and I'm going to show you this funny website here in a minute. The example uh, from the textbook that I've used in the past um, is that there's a positive correlation between ice cream sales and crime rate, and does eating ice cream cause you to want to commit a crime? Well, obviously, yes. No, that's not true. Does committing a crime cause you to want to eat ice cream? Well, I don't know that I've ever committed a major crime, so uh, <laughs> I wouldn't know. Uh, but Obviously, these are kind of strange relationships to have. And the answer is yes. No. Uh, in this case, there's probably a third variable. So the, the, there is a relationship there. You're seeing a correlation between ice cream sales and crime, but one is not causing the other. And this is an illustration of why correlation does not imply causation. Um, the third variable, you guys can think about a possible third variable that might cause both. For example, it being hot outside or just the summer season. Uh, might cause ice cream sales to go up, and it might also cause crime to go up um, at the same time. So there's a, a cause, but it's not named in the correlation. The correlation between ice cream sales and crime exists, but it's not. There, there's not a, a causation there. Okay, so this brings me to the uh, Spurious Correlation website, which I have posted a link to on your uh, on your um, on your class website on Canvas. Uh, this this is. Um, a silly website. There's also a book that this guy has written where he's compiled a bunch of these. Um, it's a it's a further um, ridiculous uh, uh, demonstration of correlation. So uh, I'm just going to scroll through. You can go to the bottom of this page and um, generate your own here. Uh, so there's a couple here. Total revenue generated by arcades and computer science doctorates awarded in the U.S. So the more money that arcades generate the more computer science doctorates are awarded. Uh, one certainly does not cause the other, although we could make some hypothesis about technology perhaps. This one uh, definitely is not uh, related. Worldwide non-commercial space launches is positively correlated with sociology doctorates, meaning that the more people who have um, gotten degrees in sociology has kind of gone up and down over time the same way that uh, the number of space launches has gone up and down over time. So that one for sure there is no <laughs> relationship, it's just a coincidence. But if we say that correlation does not imply causation, we know that one does not cause the other. So if you go down, there's a bunch of strange ones um, as you go along. 
I'm going to go uh, click on discover a correlation and then if you click on this in interesting variables I'm going to avoid the causes of death one um, which <laughs> there's a lot of those uh, let's go to uh, precipitation by state and view variables uh, and then select California so let's see when it rains in California what else happens uh, at the same time uh, there's a long list of stuff okay uh, how about uh, oh, visitors to Disney World now that's the one in Florida that doesn't make any sense uh, how about visitors to California Adventure okay how about this one uh, I mean get, select this one this is per capita consumption of eggs and we see <laughs> there's a positive correlation the more it rains in California the more people eat eggs that doesn't make any sense and that applies eating people eating eggs across the entire United States alright so you can see uh, there's some relationships here what this website has done is compiled a bunch of data and then just like thrown it all into a database and see what by coincidence ends up correlating together okay so the moral of the story is uh, that you should eat more eggs because then it will rain more no that's not the moral of the story the moral of the story is that uh, there are variables out there that correlate with each other um, uh, but they may not cause each other and so correlation does not imply causation here we have a, a relationship between a mother's anxiety and baby's birth weight at least an initial one based on four families um, and by the look of the scatter plot we've figured out that it, it kind of looks like it might be negative. Um, we don't know the number yet that will be placed on that, so we're still leading up to that, uh, the, cor the correlation number, uh, which will confirm that for us. Now, the other thing we can do before we get to that number is look at how strong this correlation might look like. So we need to draw a bubble around the points, and so if you were to do that, you can kind of do that on your computer screen or your very small phone screen if you're watching this on your phone. Um, if you do that, uh, with this scatter plot, you're going to get a bubble that kind of wobbles from the top left to the bottom right a little bit more than the um, uh, top right to the bottom left. The other, the, the way to do it is you take that top left dot and you draw kind of a line down to the bottom dot right there at mom's anxiety uh, equals four. Then you go over to the right um, to the rightmost dot and then you draw it back to the um, the top left there. So if the bubble encompasses all the points then you, you've got your bubble um, and in this case it, it will start from top left and go to bottom right a little bit more than the other way so so you're looking at a correlation that is uh, relatively strong maybe but how do we determine what strong and weak is the thinner the bubble around the points the stronger the correlation so if we tried to draw a bubble and it like turned out to be a line like it was just all the do all the dots were exactly on the bubble or on the line they were all forming a line then that would be an extremely strong correlation because we would know that as uh, X increases, mom's anxiety in this case increases, that Y decreases exactly every time the same way. However, if the bubble is fat, so suppose we were to draw it around these four dots and we would form like a circle or something, or like just there would be no way to tell whether the bubble is leaning toward the left or the right, it's just a mess of dots then that's a really weak correlation and we won't be able to tell really anything from uh, birth weight based on our value for mom's anxiety there would be no relationship there and so the correlation then becomes zero or non-existent um, like i said if the bubble is so thin that it hugs the line then the correlation is going to be perfect and a perfect correlation is either a line uh, going from top left to bottom right or the opposite uh, bottom left to top right okay so uh we, we have some numbers that we can assign here, and I'll give you some examples. Carl Pearson, uh, who I introduced to you at the beginning of the semester, well, I didn't introduce you in person, he's no longer with us, but uh, you get, you, uh, I introduced you in the lecture notes, you get his picture a couple times. He is the one that put a number to this, uh, he named the number after himself, called it Pearson's Correlation. Um, he was off to a rough start. <laughs> I don't know, if I created a statistic, I could potentially see myself calling it Otten's correlation, so I won't, or Otten's whatever statistic, I won't blame Pearson for doing so. Uh, let me make this bigger again. So he suggested that um, this correlation should be between negative one and one. So a correlation of zero is no correlation at all in the middle. A correlation of positive one is a perfect positive correlation. 
and a correlation of negative one is a perfect negative one, a uh, negative correlation. So um, we'll see some examples here. So this is your, this is, well, I think I put this in your syllabus. This is as stats increases, fun increases at a perfect rate, right? So if you, <laughs> the more stats you do, the more fun you have, no matter how much, you know, whatever else is going on in the world, uh, you know that if you do more stats, you're gonna have more fun. So that's what that, that dotted line indicates. Um, and uh, there are no dots that deviate from the line or are, have any distance from the line, and therefore the, the correlation is perfectly positive. This one uh, I found online. Uh, this one, as you, you spend more money, you lose money in your bank account. Uh, okay, so that's a perfect negative correlation. As one increases, the money spent, the uh, money in your bank account decreases, so that's your perfect negative one correlation. This one is uh, your like mess of dots that doesn't make any sense. So this or it's like a zero correlation. So this one is as your toe, I didn't make this up, as your toe size increases, your SAT score does not increase. We don't know what happens to your SAT score. Uh, so there's that. This one is uh, the more hours you study, the higher the grade that you get in your class. This is a positive correlation, a very strong one but not a perfect one. So it doesn't form a perfect line. It's possible that you could study more and not do as well, but it's very likely that uh, if you study more, you will do well. So, uh, so it's not perfect. It's not always gonna be the case, but most of the time it is. This is the negative one. <laughs> maybe, maybe you disagree with this one. I don't know. Uh, the more beer you drink, and that goes up to like third 15. I, I don't know if that's per day. I hope not. Uh, maybe per week, per month. Uh, anyway, and the more beer you drink, the worse your grade is. Uh, but again, not perfect. Uh, so that's a negative correlation, and that's negative in between zero and negative one. Okay, so we're going to uh, move over to, um, to back to our computer programs here with SPSS and Excel, and we're going to get our correlation value. So we know from our, um, our scatter plot that we have probably a negative correlation because of the shape of the, the dots. And it's probably not perfect, right? Because the, the dots are not forming a line. So if we go back, we can get that value. I'm going to go to Analyze, uh, Correlate, and Bivariate. And this is uh, going to give us our option to get Pearson's correlation. I don't think he envisioned uh, himself, uh, SPSS, doing this for him as he was crunching the numbers um, uh, back in 1920. But anyway, uh, we're just going to take our two variables and move them over to the right. Uh, together, or you can do it one by one. Um, the default option here is the Pearson's correlation, so we, there's other correlations that exist. We're going to ignore those for now. Keep all the default options intact and click OK. And this is going to be your correlation table. Make this a little bit bigger. Okay. Maybe that's not bigger, but it's centered on the screen. Anyway, uh, your correlation here is negative 0 0.708. So I can show you how to read this table. This is the table. It's just very, very straightforward in terms of amount of output. Um, the uh, birth weight, mom's anxiety correlation, negative 0 0.708 is printed twice under Pearson correlation. Basically, it's printed twice because it's like correlating mom's anxiety with birth weight, and then it's correlating birth weight with mom's anxiety. So it's doing it both ways, which is redundant. So you just take uh, the 0 0.708 negative one time and you're okay. Uh, the significance value here, it, it assigns a p-value as well as uh, giving you a n. So the n is four, that's number of pairs. When you're doing the, the, uh, the correlation um, uh, process here, your, your number of, um, your n is your number of pairs as opposed to number of total values. So there's like eight total values, right? In two columns of four, and so the n that gets assigned is 4. We'll come back to that when we do this in Excel in a minute. Um, the the p-value that it's assigned, this is 0.292, greater than 0.05. So we're not rejecting the null hypothesis. Well, what null hypothesis are we not rejecting? We'll come back to that as well in a minute. Um, but the, uh, the meaning here is that uh, with the, the correlation is not significantly different than 0. So when we test a hypothesis for correlation, we're testing a hypothesis uh, that suggests that the correlation is there, right? The, the hope, if we're doing this for a real study, is that mom's anxiety is related to birth weight if we're trying to conclude something meaningful about uh, the impact of anxiety. Um, 
So uh, if that correlation exists, then our hypothesis is that there is a relationship between the two variables. The null hypothesis is that there is not a relationship. And so that translates over for correlation. If we reject the null hypothesis, we're rejecting a correlation being equal to zero. That's your null hypothesis. Uh, that there is no correlation, or the correlation is equal to zero. That's your null. The alternative is that the correlation exists, or that the correlation is not zero. And so with this p-value 0.292 greater than 0.05 suggests we should not reject the null hypothesis, and we should conclude that the correlation is in fact not significantly different than zero. Now, negative 0.708, that's a pretty big value. It's pretty far away from zero. In fact, it's closer to one than, or closer to negative one than zero. So that's kind of weird that it's not significantly different than zero. But in this case, uh, we can be confident in our conclusion of not rejecting the null hypothesis because, what do you guys think? Should I pause? No. Uh, we're not rejecting the null hypothesis and we can be confident in that because the sample size is very small. So if we're going to conclude something about mom's anxiety and birth weight, we've only got four families, so how much can we really conclude? And that's why, in the end, this um, result is coming out non-significant. All right, so uh, we suspect that our correlation is uh, negative from the scatter plot. Then we see from SPSS that it is, in fact, negative at a point, about a 0.7 value. So how did that... 0.7 value come about. Uh, well, here we are in Excel, and we're going to show you how to do this. Uh, this is what Pearson came up with somehow, some way, uh, back in about 1920. Um, and there's a couple of different ways to do this. So if you've seen this done in the, in the textbook, there are a couple of equivalent algebraic formulas that land you on the same answer. Um, and so I'm going to give you the one that makes the most sense to me, um, and just show you the steps here in Excel so that it, it's relatively straightforward hopefully for you to take this video and apply it to your own Excel file when you're doing your homework um, and make this work for you. So this is your X and Y variables. This is X, uh, mother's anxiety, and Y, baby's birth weight, just uh, stolen from the notes. So the first thing to do here is calculate means and standard deviations for each one rather than uh, sitting here and doing this all out in all the steps. I'm going to take the um, uh, Excel shortcuts for you. Uh, so the first one is to type in equals average. The, the, the function for mean in Excel is not mean, M-E-A-N, it's average spelled out there. So you go equals average parentheses and then you highlight what you need here in the parentheses. That's going to highlight the four numbers that you need to calculate. And you're going to get 3.85 for your mean for X. Then, you know, rather than having to do that again, you can copy paste this over. So if you go to this 3.85, there's a couple different ways to copy this over. You can just go to edit copy or you can click command C on a Mac and then command V to paste it over. Um, that would be control C, I think it is, on a PC. So what that does is not only copy paste the mean over but it actually aggregates it, meaning that it takes that uh, mean here. If you double click in here, it'll aggregating means it, it knows that you want to calculate the mean of this column, the y column, when you move that over, as opposed to the x column, which is pretty cool. Uh, so it gives you the mean there, 6.935 for uh, the birth weight values. Similar process for standard deviation, you're going to click, or you're going to type uh, equals STDEV parentheses. That's the shortcut to get a standard deviation. You got to be careful not to include the mean in there. Uh, you just want the four numbers that were the original data uh, values for x. And so you go STDEV, parentheses, highlight, and parentheses, and you get your standard deviation for X or mom's anxiety. And then you can copy paste it over. The other way to copy paste, by the way, you take this cell, you highlight it once, and then there's like a little tiny box square in the lower right of that cell. And it, when you hover the cursor over it, it becomes a black plus sign. You can click that and it'll drag your uh, there's so many different shortcuts here. You drag the that over to the right, and that's going to drag your formula over and also aggregate. So then your standard deviation is basically the same thing as before. Copy, paste it over, and it knows to calculate the standard deviation of the y values, which in this case comes out to be 0.91146. Okay, so you got your means and standard deviations. That's the first step toward getting uh, your 
um, Pearson's correlation here. The next is to calculate z-scores. So z-scores, I taught you before, you were like, ah, this is going to be useless. Well, here it is again. Um, we're calculating z-scores because we need to, in order to compare x and y, I'll just give you the short version of this, in order to compare x and y, we need to put them on the same scale. So if you recall, anxiety was on a 1 to 10 scale. Birth weight is not really on a 1 to 10 scale. I mean, it could be, but birth weight technically could be greater than 10 or, or I guess, less than 1, although you don't see that, uh, hopefully. So anyway, you have to put x and y on the same scale um, in order to be able to correlate them or see if there's a relationship between them. And so putting them on the same scale means making z-scores out of them, because when you make z-scores out of them, you uh, have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, we apply our z-score formula, and luckily we can do some copy-pasting here, and it won't take too much time. Um, uh, or that is, we only have four values as well, so per x and per y, it won't take too much time. Okay, so we're going to go equals. We're going to click on x here, 3.4. That's the first x value. We're going to subtract. Now, I'm not going to click on the mean. You can do this, but when you click on it, it kind of it it wants to aggregate, and the aggregating is not good in this case because uh, it, it messes up your... It, it pulls the mean down, and so then for the next one down, it takes the standard deviation instead of the mean. Long story short, don't click on the mean and standard deviation values. Just type them in manually. That's my best advice here. So 3.85 is your mean. That's what you're subtracting. So again, the z-score formula, value 3.4 minus the mean 3.85 divided by the standard deviation, in this case 1.74, and I'll keep a few more decimals here, 0, 6, 8, 9, 5, just to be precise. Okay, so that's your z-score formula, and so you get a z-score of negative 0.258 for that first value. Then you can copy-paste safely down the, the column if you want. Uh, it will aggregate the B2 value to become B3 and B4 and B5, so on, uh, while keeping the mean and standard deviation the same. So if we do that thing where we highlight the cell, click on the lower right corner to get the plus sign to drag down, you're going to drag down and get your z-scores for the other three there. Um, same thing for y, you're going to go equals, parentheses, click on the first y value, 6.81, minus, then manually type in the means. Just make sure you don't mix up the x mean with the y mean or something like that. So this, you got to go 6.935 because that's the y mean that you're subtracting, divided by the standard deviation, 0.911464. And again, don't click on that, just type it in, um, and you'll get your z-score for uh, uh, the first y value. And if you click and drag down, it will aggregate down the column, and you're going to get your z-scores for the other three y's as well. For the last step here, we're going to multiply. Now, multiplying technically, mathematically, is going to get us what we need because now we're looking at the relationship between x and y, right? If you multiply them together, that's you're kind of combining them in some way. And so once you combine them together, then that's going to end up being a measurement of the relationship between x and y, the larger this value. Uh, then the greater the relationship. So uh, you're going to go equals, and you're just going to click uh, through here. You're going to go click on D2, which is your Z value for the first X. Multiply, which is this, the asterisk, that's uh, capital 8 on your keyboard. So D2 star, or asterisk, and then E2, that's your Z value for the first uh, Y. And so uh, if you multiply that, it's the z-score for x, the first x, times the z-score for the first y, and you're going to get 0 0.03, and then you can copy and paste that down, and again, it will aggregate so it knows, for example, this, um, this second z, x, z, y value is 1.9 times 8.3 equals negative, uh, I'm sorry, it's negative 1.12. Strike that from the video. Well, I'll just keep it there. Uh, the one... Let me start again. Negative 1.59 is negative 1.12 times 1.42 and so on. Okay, so again, the larger the value here, the, the closer the relationship between those two x and y values. But in order to get the overall correlation between all x and all y values, we're going to get a sum here. Uh, so you're going to look at a sum. The sum is just sum and uh, you're going to add, what are we summing? We're adding up the four values for zx, zy. So uh, again, each 
one of those represents the relationship between x and y, but the collective relationship across all x and y values is represented by summing them up. So the sum there, negative 2.12, still doesn't have meaning until you're going to get your Pearson's R. And the last step here is to spell Pearson's name correctly. Okay, I'm going to put that in bold print as with this one. Okay, so what do we need to do? We have our sum of our uh, values of zx, zy, or z score x times z score y summed up. And then we divide that by n minus 1. So we're going to go equals click on that value, that sum value, and divide by n minus 1. In this case, as I mentioned before, n is the number of pairs. This is the biggest key. This seems very complicated and lots of steps, but in my experience, when my students have this, um, this template in front of them, it's not terrible. And the thing that they forget the most often is to divide by n minus 1 as opposed to something else like n or forgetting what n is. So in this case, n is number of pairs, number of xy pairs, and so that's 4, not 8 in this case, it's 4 pairs, and so n minus 1 is going to be 3, and then you get your value of negative 0.7078, which should match your um, SPSS value. So I went through that very fast, so if you watch that in one sitting without stopping and rewinding at all, and you got it, uh, I am surprised. So when you're doing your homework, uh, go back, feel free to rewind many times and um, catch all that amazing wisdom that I just provided you by way of Carl Pearson uh, to get your negative 0.7078 value ultimately uh, calculated. Okay, so uh, the last step here is to make our conclusion. I already talked about this when we got our SPSS output, so this will be a little bit of a review to finish up, but uh, we return to our triangle. If you guys are um, Remembering from the uh, hypothesis testing roadmap, uh, we have that triangle. If the p-value is less than 0.05, reject the null hypothesis. But also, if the test statistic is greater than the critical value, then the other two are true. So what is our test statistic and what is our critical value? That's the remaining step here just to, to finish out the triangle. So as I mentioned earlier, our null hypothesis is that the correlation is zero, implying no relationship in this case between a pregnant mother's anxiety and the health of her baby. Uh, the significant correlation then would imply that the alternative is true and that the correlation value is not uh, equal to zero or significantly different than zero. So in calculating this test statistic, you need to do a bunch more stuff. No, actually we just calculated it. It's R, it's Pearson's R. So all we need to do, that, so that's, that's done. Uh, I didn't call it the test statistic when we were running through there, that process, but that's what it is. Uh, so all we need to do then is compare that to the critical value. And so if we go to our table here, the critical value table uh, is linked on your Canvas page. This is going to be um, the table that you need. And we need to determine our degrees of freedom. So let me um, show you that as well. So what's our degrees of freedom? Degrees of freedom is uh, n minus 2, this is annoying because I told you that n minus 1, when you have one sample of data, uh, is the degrees of freedom uh, uh, rule of thumb. So now we have n minus 2. Well, the 2 is there because we don't have one sample anymore. We have two samples. Uh, technically, we have x and y. We're both representing samples of data. So now we're subtracting 2 instead of 1 for that reason. The other thing to remember here is that uh, n equals um, the number of pairs, as I keep mentioning, so uh, if you take 4, you subtract 2, you get 2. That's your degrees of freedom here. Um, if you go to the critical value table then and select alpha 0.05, uh, you're going to get uh, your value there, 0.95, which is a very large value. Uh, so degrees of freedom 2 uh, for a two-tailed test, um, you go across to 0.05 for alpha, and you get 0.95. So that uh, suggests that our... Um, T, or I'm sorry, our uh, Pearson's R, not T, Pearson's R test statistic needs to be greater than 0.95 in absolute value in order to reject our null hypothesis. So this 0.95 is positive or negative. In our case, we had 0 0.707 negative uh, for our uh, test statistic value or our Pearson's R value. So that value is then compared to negative 0.95. So if you have a negative correlation, you get your critical value here and you make your critical value negative. Um, or 
you take the absolute value of both. So that would flip it and make your Pearson's R negative 0 0.707 into a positive, and you can compare that to 0.95 positive. Either way, the signs need to match in order to uh, make the comparison. In this case, then, let's go with the positive. 0 0.707 positive is less than 0.95, uh, and thus we do not reject our null hypothesis. So we already knew that we were not going to reject our null hypothesis because we found that the p-value in back in SPSS was greater than 0.05. Now we've confirmed that by uh, revealing that our test statistic is less than our critical value. Uh, so wh why are we, I mean, it seems like a 0 0.707 correlation, again, is pretty big on the negative side, but uh, the sample size is small. And you can see that with the degrees of freedom values here. As the degrees of freedom goes up, that's implying your sample size is going up, and the critical value is actually going down, which implies that the bigger the sample, the easier it is to reject your null hypothesis and make a meaningful conclusion. So that's why people like to get bigger and bigger samples. Uh, oftentimes is because uh, they're more meaningful uh, for hypothesis testing. Okay, that's your uh, correlation um, video. I'm going to pause. We'll do the regression one next.